Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim, one of the Glaucoma Fellows. So we're going to be, uh, we have no financial disclosures. We're going to be talking about a couple cases um, about a particular lens that we've been using for the Yamani technique. So for the first case, 84-year-old female with pseudoexfoliation glaucoma presents with sudden blurred visions, had cataract surgeries, multiple IOL exchanges on the typical glaucoma drops. Seeing 2,600 out of that right eye pinhole, so 2,150, pressure spiked up. And just for those interested in kind of her biometry, her axial length is 22.84 in the right eye, 22.67 in the left. Steep Ks in the right. Uh, in the first case, undergoes a uh, pars plane of vitrectomy, Gore-Tex scleral fixation of the IOL um, in August. Initially was a bit hypotenuse, but then the IOL was found to be tilted at that time. Was exchanged for a Yamani CT Lucia uh, 19 diopter lens post-op day one, presented with a rotisserie um, in which the lens was poking through the pupil. Um, underwent a, another exchange thought maybe it was the first lens, um, exchanged it for a second Yamani, uh, CT Lucia, uh, 19 diopter lens, and then post-op day one also had significant tilt. Uh, so finally, in April, after the eye settled down, ended up getting an IOL exchange and an AC IOL was placed. At the end, after uh, five months, she ended up 20-25 in that eye. So in a second case, our 54-year-old male had bilateral white cataracts. He underwent cataract surgery in the right eye, but unfortunately there was a complication with a PC rupture and a drop lens, and he was left aphakic. Count fingers in both eyes, uh, one due to uh, being aphakic and the other one due to a white cataract in the other eye. Axial length was 23.83 in the right eye, 24 diopters in the left eye. And so after the drop lens, he received a pars plane of vitrectomy, the frag removal, and received a CT Lucia placed with the Yamani technique. Um, didn't show up to his post-op day one appointment, but when he came um, on post-op week two, also similarly had a rotisserie uh, CT Lucia, he underwent um, IOL exchange with the AR40. So this is when he initially represented our post-op week two. We could see here that the lens is tilted, so you're seeing the more anterior portion of that lens and a zoomed in photo here on the right. After his uh, most recent IOL exchange, he was 2025, and the left eye is uh, awaiting cataract surgery. And our last case, so a 74-year-old male, pseudophagic in both eyes, has mild to moderate POAG, um, had trauma to his left forehead, presented with decreased vision and a dislocated IOL, also history of RK, um, and has had uh, regmatogenous renal detachments in both eyes. So in that left eye, he was 2800, in which there is the dislocation, otherwise 2025 in the right eye, with best correction. Uh, slightly longer eyes, and the right eye is 29.97, left eye 27.95. Ks are particularly flat due to the RK. So November 28th, uh, he received a pars plane of vitrectomy, got a Sommerings removal, um, placed a CT Lucia with a Yamani technique, um, and on post-up day one had a 93... Uh, 90 degree rotisserie, and then a recently received IOL exchange with pupiloplasty and placement with a ZA9003. So these were some of his pictures. So on the left, we see all the RK, temporal incision that's closed, and this is poking through the pupil. Maybe a little bit better view on the right image. And then, so this is a narrated view of, uh, or video by Dr. Nakatsuka. Um, so this is a rotisserie CT Lucia and his technique for removal and IOL exchange. This is Austin Nakatsuka with the CT Lucia 602 rotisserie IOL removal. So what the heck is going on here? That lens doesn't look right. That is the edge of the lens pointed right at the cornea. It looks just like rotisserie chicken. All right, let's start exploring around. We gotta find those haptics. Those things must be out of place, right? Let's dig around here. We're doing a little pyridomy. Looking around here. 
Oh, there's the haptic. It looks fine. It has the bulb and it's implanted in the sclerotomy. What about the other one? Digging around. Oh, that one's fine too. The bulb's right there. So there's nothing wrong with those haptics in those sclerotomies. All right, well, at this point, we know that the haptic bulbs are fine and they're in place where they're supposed to be. So I don't know, we got to get this thing out. So we're going to go ahead and put some viscoelastic in here. And yeah, it's just going to the back of the eye. That's not supposed to happen. And now we're going to use the diamond step blade to make a stepped incision. That's for a large wound to be able to easily, more easily seal. All right, so to get these bulbs out, I use a 30 gauge needle and basically I use the tip of it to kind of poke the bulb and gently kind of tease it out of there until it's, there it is. You can see the haptic completely. And then we can just cut off the bulb right there. So now we reach in there with the MST micrograspers and do an ab internal approach to remove the haptics from the sclerotomy and place it into the anterior chamber. And then now what I'm doing is I'm securing this haptic through a paracentesis because if I had a dollar for every time I didn't do that and drop the lens, I would have like two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so after the other bulb is cut and removed the, from the sclerotomy, it's time to position the lens so that it can be easily removed from the eye. Uh, but that's easier said than done, as you can see here. But essentially when it comes to these situations, I like to rely on the principle of essentially dialing the lens and rotating it in the direction that it's supposed to be, which is clockwise. And then we go cut, cut, cut with our intraocular lens scissors. And we have two pieces from which it is much easier to remove from the eye. A little tip when removing the lens piece, grab it from the section where the IOL optic haptic junction is facing towards the wound instead of away, or it'll get stuck in the wound. And so now we're struggling to get the second piece out. And the reason why is actually because the haptic is twisted 90 degrees away from the plane of the IOL. And it's not supposed to be like that. And we certainly didn't do it when we were doing our removal of this lens. It was already like that. But we got the lens out and now we have to put another lens in there. So what technique are we gonna use? Well, the Yamane scleral fixation, of course, because that sort of worked the first time. But the question is, what kind of lens are we gonna use? So this whole thing happened because there was a twisting of the haptic in the optic haptic junction. And essentially this appears to mainly occur with this particular lens, the CT Lucia 602. And so in this case, we're gonna use a different type of lens because using that same lens again, well, I don't think that would be very smart. So in this case, what we used was the ZA9003 lens, which has PMMA haptics, which are a little more rigid and a little more difficult to use for the Yamane technique. Uh, however, uh, in this circumstance, I have not yet had a rotisserie phenomenon with this lens, and so we decided to use it. I did not use the AR40 lens in this case because the spherical aberration profile for the ZA9003 was actually very good for this patient who had a previous history of RK. It matched up very well because it's a prolate lens that matches with his oblate cornea after the RK. So the haptic bulbs created by the PMMA lens flange technique are a little smaller than the bulbs for the CT Lucia 602, so that's something to be aware of. And additionally, the haptics can be a little bit more difficult to work with, which is also why the CT Lucia lens is used, because the PVDF haptics are a lot more flexible and easier to use on the Yamani technique. But this lens centered really nicely and looks really good in the eye, but here we see this little defect temporally in the iris, and I said, oh, I think I should go ahead and fix that. So we're throwing a little iris suture here, reaching in, grabbing those 10 proline suture ends, and I'm just gonna go ahead and tie it up here so that it looks all nice, and more importantly, because the iris 
pupil uh, will be able to cover the edge of the entire IOL so that the patient is less likely to get dysphotopsias. And we get a great looking outcome at the end and the patient also looked very good. This is awesome. And so this, uh, courtesy of Dr. Mamelis's lab, this is a zoomed in photo of the lens that was explanted. Um, you can see here the optic haptic junction that the haptics are kind of twisted on both of them. Um, and this is the kind of trailing haptic and then the leading haptic here, zoomed in photo just to kind of look at the architecture. The, the optic haptic junction is still intact, but it's kind of twisted on itself. Um, patient has uh, just had the surgery, but he called into the VA to tell us he is happy, happy, happy with his vision, um, despite the RK and multiple surgeries. So I'll just talk a little bit about this rotisserie phenomenon. Um, and so as you may have gathered, as Dr. Nakatsuka mentioned, it's just like a rotisserie chicken with that optic rotating around the haptic at the haptic optic junction, hallmarked by good IOL centration intra-op, but then in the early post-operative period, you're, you're noticing that severe IOL tilt. It's most commonly observed with the CT Lucia 602, but has been seen with other three-piece IOLs as well. And we'll talk a little bit about the speculated mechanisms today. The long story short is that no one really knows. Most people think that it's due to haptic instability at that haptic optic junction, but there are some people that think as well that with this PBDF haptic, which is more flexible, that it tolerates more manipulation prior to kinking the haptic, which then may dislodge or disrupt the architecture at that optic haptic junction versus PMMA where you would actually kink the haptic prior to creating that rotisserie effect or inducing that instability. Um, the first reported cases of this started around 2022 early that year. Uh, the only real change um, in the manufacturing process of the CT Lucia uh, is somewhat proprietary, but the attachment or the haptic attachment process did change in 2021. Previously, they did uh, mix the epoxy right on site, and then the haptic was hand dipped and inserted into the optic. Uh, and now the new method, which was an FDA recommendation, was a premixed epoxy that a preset amount of that is then placed on the end of the haptic. Um, Zeiss has said, and interestingly, that over half of the cases of rotisserie were reported prior to the manufacturing change, so you can't necessarily do a cause and effect there. And they've been really unable to recreate this rotisserie effect on benchtop studies, either at room temp or at body temp. Um, and they also comment that the forces required to cause that haptic optic junction failure do exceed FDA standards. However, there have been studies where Yamanis have been done in simulis and then placed at body temp for two days, and that showed a 5 to 6% rotisserie rate, which is fairly high. Um, but in short, we don't really know why this is happening yet. An ongoing study is happening. I put together a list of the cases that I was able to find online published, um, although there are many more on CareNet and other forums, and they all kind of fall within that date of 2021 to 2022 at multiple studies, multiple surgeons, or multiple sites. Um, and I, just to mention, I, I think it's important to then talk about the alternatives, right? So there have been biomechanical studies on the haptic stability and the flange stability of the other various three-piece IOLs available. And so this one uh, looked at the haptic diameter as well as how much force it takes to pull that flange through the sclera and how much force it takes to disinsert the haptic at the optic haptic junction. And so as Dr. Nakatsuka mentioned, you can see here the PVDF haptic of the CT Lucia is more mushroom shaped and you get kind of these dumbbell shapes with the other uh, PMMA haptics. And what that equates to and, and borne out in the study is that actually it, it took higher force to pull that um, CT Lucia through the sclera compared to the other lenses. Interestingly as well, the CT Lucia in this study did outperform the other IOLs in the amount of force needed to actually dislocate the haptic. However, that was linear force applied like parallel to the optic. It wasn't rotational force, which would kind of be needed to create that rotisserie problem. I also included the AR40 here. They didn't study it, but it's another common lens used for Yamani technique. Um, and the 
haptic is certainly larger diameter. It's harder to fit into that TSK lumen, uh, but it does fit and is used very commonly. So besides alternative lenses, there have been some, um, not studies, but work done at how to stabilize the haptic at the optic to haptic junction. So this was a video posted on AAO where they actually used an argon laser, which can contract the PVDF haptic. Um, and by contracting it, you're increasing the diameter. I don't know if this is going to load here. But basically, he's showing that you can change the haptic architecture with the laser. And then he pulls out the haptic of the CT Lucia and then reinserts it to create that rotisserie. And I'll just show it rotating here. So you can freely rotate it, creating that phenomena. And then he'll apply laser at the level of the haptic optic junction to expand the diameter of the haptic and then stabilize that. Um, so some folks are advocating with the CT CLNs lens that prior to insertion into the eye, you could apply argon laser to prevent that C uh, rotisserie post-op. Here's the references. Um, hope this generates a little bit of discussion. I don't know if Dr. Nakatsuka is still on, but I'm sure he has some comments as well. Thank you. Dr. Manless. Well, this has been a very frustrating situation for surgeons because the CT Lucia was ideal for the for the Yamani because the PDDM haptics are flexible, they don't keep, they don't break, and they make that nice bulb on the end. And the thing is, this did not show up prior to a couple of years ago. And people have been using this lens before that time. And so I swear that you know that you know that change was a small change and they can't reproduce it in a laboratory and they can't cause the rotisserie chip, and yet it's occurred. So it's a very, very frustrating situation because the PBDF haptics were ideal for this, whereas the extruder PMMA, although you can do it and they're good, they're a little bit more fragile, they're a little bit more difficult to get in there, they don't quite make that bulb on the end that's as, as good of I mean, not keeping a point for the square as a PBDF. And so, I mean, I don't know, I, this is such a small, group of patients that are having this done, I don't think a company's going to sit and design an ILO specifically for this. And that's the problem with this. And so there's still arguments. Amy Lynn sent a really nice email from the conference she was in, again, where they discussed this at length, and I still don't think people have the answers to why this is happening. But it changed the way they glue it in there, and that this is, you know, they're having this rotisserie happen since then. So obviously, you have to look at cause and effect, and that's probably the most important one. Very good. If there's no other online comments. We'll move on to Dr. Ahmed here. Hey, Cole. Yes. Yamani, I don't know if Dr. Yamani ever described having this in his own experience. I haven't seen anything published. Has he that. published? No. Sure. You know, I think the main thing he used was a Hoya lens. Yeah. In Japan, that just hasn't had that difficulty or problem. Yeah. And it all has to do with staking, which is a kind of an art form, staking that overall haptic. And it's just not made for the, obviously, is, is it staked when it's just sitting there passively in the sulcus for what have your money there's just a little bit of torque it's just not obviously the present lens is some that we have available on it and apparently with the oil lens they've never, just never had that problem. interesting Thanks, Randy. so dr ahmed is our keynote speaker here today we're appreciative appreciative of his uh, willingness to present as everybody knows dr ahmed world-renowned complex anterior segment surgeon he is also the director of our alan crandall glaucoma uh, research uh, foundation uh, so we'll turn the time over to him excited to hear his presentation thanks, Bill. thanks so much uh, great to be up here um, as a Moran faculty, and, and uh, thanks, Ethan, for the technical uh, assistance here. It's uh, not always easy um, figuring out how to present on the Teams as well as uh, it's on the screen here, so thank you. Um, and yes, thank you so much for, uh, for listening in here and enjoy the presentations from our fellows. Great job. These guys have been fantastic uh, surgeons. 
I thought for the next while I would share with you, um, you know, some perspectives on, on approaching uh, patients who don't have adequate capsule for fixation, which, you know, we continue to see here, um, and also, uh, you know, share maybe some technique pearls. Um, you know, I do have a talk which is a, a, a very large evidence-based talk. Uh, as much as we could on this topic, but as you can imagine, this is a hard one to study, and I didn't want to. Uh, I'll have a summary slide that the AEO put out, um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago on this topic. Uh, these are my disclosures, and uh, a lot of things uh, happening in the space in glaucoma and cataract, and it's been great to collaborate, but also recognizing the the biases that we have working with industry and making sure that we disclose it. Uh, it's been. Um, it's been, a, it's been a year and a half or more that I've been here and it's been uh, an incredible experience just being part of the Moran family and getting a chance to work with many of you here and, and collaborating together. Uh, this is truly a world-class place and I, and I feel very privileged to be here. So it's quite an honor for me to be up here even speaking during Grand Rounds as well, those of you that are, that are, that are here and listening as well. Of course, we know the capsular bag is, is our ideal uh, position for an IOL and we often fight for that, right? We retain uh, all the techniques we can to support Support the capsular bag. We suture in segments and elements to do that. Um, but of course, there's situations where, where we just don't have capsule, or the capsule zonular apparatus is not sufficient. And so the question is, uh, is how do we manage these? Now, these can be situations where we need to put a secondary lens in, where there are no capsule or zonular support, or a situation where we need to do an exchange for whatever reason, or do a repositioning. Now, there's a, obviously a lot of debate in terms of what is the uh, right approach. Uh, for managing these cases. Um, and uh, we debate, of course, whether we should think about going anteriorly or going posteriorly. As you heard earlier, I just, I think I just caught a quick glimpse of your, of your case. I mean, ACI OL 2025, I mean, you look at that and you go, that's, uh, that's not a bad outcome there. So uh, there's a lot of debate on this. Obviously, we have our biases. I think, you know, those that practice an anterior segment and, and do cornea work are, are probably going to be a little bit uh, against the ACI OL world. But I have to say, we've had a lot of experience with ACI OLs. Uh, we've used the artisan lens, which is also can be enclavated on the anterior iris and posterior iris. And I think those of you who do use ACI OLs, I don't I don't think there's any shame in that, but I think the key is really kind of picking the right patient and understanding what technique will work best for what patient. And then when we have the posterior approaches, we have a variety of approaches that have been popularized even more than what I've written here. Obviously, the intraspinal haptic fixation, double needle technique, or Yamani has been described and, and is popularized. Suturing of, of IOL still occurs and is still one of my preferences, actually. Um, and, uh, and then iris sutured lenses, which I'll, which I'll touch on as well. And I think that has become a bit less in vogue, but I think it's actually a, a really uh, useful uh, tool in our armamentarium. When there's, a, when there's an eye well in a bag like this, as you see here, a one-piece lens in this example, this, and this is so common. Of course, in Utah, we see this a lot. Um, I know, Nick, in your lab, I'm sure you have this uh, you know, a dime a dozen every week. Um, you know, regardless of the eye well design, these can be really ideally still fixated by a variety of approaches. Uh, I just recognize, actually, this is a paper I published with Alan. Uh, back uh, many years ago after my fellowship. Um, and uh, using a variety of different uh, loop techniques, this can be done quite well. Now, when the eye was not in the bag, we don't necessarily have the advantage of a capsular bag and some of the fibrotic uh, you know, material around it to hold the lens in place. And you know, my approach is when there's a three-piece lens, I certainly consider that maybe we can reposition it to the iris or reposition it to the sclera. And certainly, if it's a three-piece like this, depending on the design, uh, they may be amenable for, uh, for spittle fixation. Um, I haven't found much success with PMA rigid lenses. Uh, they're just harder to work with, of course. Um, and so those typically are, are more difficult. And I certainly don't iris suture those or typically don't try to spittle fixate those lenses in my own personal experience. Uh, One-piece lenses, of course, are not really as suitable for iris sutured in, in conventional means or interstitial haptic fixation, but certainly could use an IOL piercing or IOL punch technique that can be used as well. Um, both these approaches, I think, uh, can be useful. On the left, you see an iris sutured lens that's been repositioned to the iris, and on the right, you see a sclera sutured lens, and both these lenses appear to be in a very physiologic position in that retropupillary space. Um, some of the observations I think that many of us have, when we go slow fixation, we need to recognize that typically a more extensive vitrectomy is required. In fact, many would argue uh, potentially a partial plane of vitrectomy needs to be done because there's often a fair amount of manipulation and traction near the vitreous base. Uh, you watch the Imani videos and you see the lens contorting and moving and maneuvering around, and, and that can potentially cause risk uh, to peripheral retinal um, pathology. 
Um, you know, ideally, when we do split-phase halo lenses, we need to use some sort of infusion line with all the manipulation that's required. This can be AC or my preference, parse planar. This, of course, increases the complexity of the approach. The benefit, of course, is that there's minimal uveal contact. It's more physiologic in its position. And there's less chance for aerodonesis or eyewoldonesis because it's thoroughly fixated, suspended by the sclera. Some of the pearls with these approaches is that external landmarks are critical. We've seen complications occur because of uh, malposition of these lenses, positioning them too anteriorly to the iris, for example. And they can be more prone to tilting and decentration because of the approaches, whether the scleral tunnels are short or the bending of the haptics or the landmarks are not adequate. And of course, uh, as a glaucoma surgeon, we're always a bit worried about the external manipulation of the conjunctiva and sclera. Um, you know, certainly for, for um, in-the-bag uh, lenses, uh, these can be fixated, as I mentioned earlier. And as I mentioned earlier, when the bag is not present, these can be fixated to the sclera by a variety of approaches. And this is certainly, many would argue, the most physiologic position. But as I said before, we do see a number of patients that end up with pupil capture or UGG syndrome because of an anteriorly placed IOL. And, and probably the biggest problem is because surgeons are typically using the limbus as a landmark. A limbus is a reasonable landmark for sclerosis fixation or, or sulcus fixation. In large eyes particularly, this relationship is, is not adequate. And so this is just an example looking at the cons insertion. I'm just pointing out the posture of the blue zone. If you're a glaucoma, you recognize the posterior blue zone. I'll show another video. And if you were to draw a line from the posterior edge of the blue zone, you should reliably be placed into the anterior TM. In fact, as glaucoma specialists, when we place tubes in the eye, we look at that landmark and we often enter the eye at that point. If you were to go 1.5 millimeters back from the posterior blue zone, that should put you in the plane, assuming that the needle is entered perpendicular. That's important as well. And so the relationship between the conjunctival insertion or limbus and the blue zone is quite variable. In a myopic patient, it may be two or three millimeters. Hyperopic patient may be one millimeter. However, the relationship between the posterior blue zone and the zonular plane is typically fixed. So certainly, if we look at the blue zone, that is more likely to be a consistent landmark. Now, most eyes, the distance between the limbus and the blue zone is one millimeter. So if you go back 2.5 from the limbus, you'll be good in most eyes. But we're not here to do good in most eyes. We're here to do good in all eyes. And that means it's helpful to identify where that blue zone is and use that blue zone to identify where that zonular plane would be. Whatever technique we use, Yamani or slip fixation or whatever you use. And so although 2.5 is reasonable as far as the landmark, for most eyes, it's helpful to identify the blue zone, identify where it is, and it's helpful. It's harder to examine without the conjunctiva. We do grapple with this, but in myopic eyes at least, recommend that we should go at least 2.5 or farther and try looking at that blue zone. This is uh, just an example of uh, that one piece lens in the bag. Despite probably the chagrin of some, there is rarely vitreous prolapse. These are typically, if you catch them early enough, sitting on the anterior hyoid. And with a couple of iris hooks supporting the capsular bag, the rexus is a great place to support the eye well temporarily with those hooks. Uh, we can support it there, and then we, we're making that radial incision, centering it again on that, uh, on that, on that 1.5 from the posterior blue zone or 2.5 from, uh, from the limbus. These are again placed a, a millimeter and a half to two millimeters apart. Gore-Tex is our preferred suture, and we try to again pass that needle, uh, you know, mid shaft or toward the haptic optic junction. It's important, of, co of course, to have them 100 degrees apart, and it's a very elegant, very straightforward technique. You see this minimal manipulation of the lens; everything's stable, AC's formed, and again, as I said before, in my experience over many years now, and uh, over uh, you know, decade and a half or more, uh, we don't, we we have rarely found the need to do vitrectomy, and so we rarely need to do that. Um, of course, it's important to, to look for that, and I, by no means is, am I shy about saying that. Uh, over the years, we've moved, of course, from 10-0 to 9-0 to Gore-Tex for reasons of suture breakage. That is certainly a preferred approach. And even in extreme situations like this, where a patient's had a multifocal lens on the retina <laughs> sitting there, uh, you know, that, that lens is certainly functions well. Uh, those, those refractive surgeons probably understand why this patient has a hyperoptic, hyperoptic surprise, right? You know, <laughs> um, uh, This patient had a CTR in place as well. We brought it up after doing a full vitrectomy. And that lens looks pretty good right there, if only they could keep it there. And, uh, and so the same approaches uh, we use here. Again, using a micrograsper, we find very helpful to grab the rexus edge. Your rexus edge is really your, your, your temporary stabilization point 
whether it's a, it's a fresh dislocated you know, crystalline lens or whether it's a, 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 you know, seven years post-op case like this. And the iris hooks are really nice. They can really help support that bag really well in four points. Now we have the eye well, well positioned. And again, this is all about measurements, alignment, uh, ensuring um, you know, that, we're, that we're adequately spaced apart. I'm placing my marks to center the sutures uh, again at that uh, 1.5 from the posterior blue zone. Uh, and basically, this is again a very similar approach. There's our needle passes. We're going around the haptic and the CTR. Second pass made there, and there we have our loop. I like to do a slip knot because probably the hardest part of these techniques isn't the suture pass, it's the tension, exactly, Dr. Olson. And, and that we often spend five, ten minutes on the table to adjust that. And obviously, you can imagine for a multifocal lens, I cannot afford to have any tilt or decentration here. The other eye he was happy with, by the way, and he had a, had a multifocal in that eye and he was happy with it. Um, and so that is, uh, that's exquisite. So, so slip knots will adjust the tension. We'll use the uh, Purkinje image on the coaxial reflex from the microscope. The first Purkinje was on the cornea, centering that bullseye, back and forth, back and forth, uh, until we're happy with that. And you can see why the benefit of having an infusion line keeps the globe physiologically firm, uh, and, uh, and then um, ensuring we have good centration uh, with that lens. And I think you, hopefully you can agree that we're pretty good there. We'll lock that, very important to bury those uh, Gore-Tex sutures uh, to prevent uh, erosion, and verifying that uh, that position is, is what we've done here. And you can see that the unoperated eye and the operated eye are, are fairly similar. Maybe you may, you may tell me I created a couple of degrees of tilt, but but you know with that with that amount of exquisiteness as we are as microsurgeons, it could be amazing. Now with the, now the uh, the uh, piercing flange or bellow technique is popularized as many, many of you have seen either using a, a, a punch through the optic material or, or haptic material, or just passing a needle directly through it. Um, and, and this is an alternative to Gore-Tex, it's more readily available around the world, and it kind of takes off from uh, kind of Brava and uh, McCabe and Yamani approaches on that as well. Um, this is an approach actually by Cole, actually, in the last uh, couple of months, very well done, a patient pseudo X, again, that lens is sitting on the anterior hyloid. And uh, this is particularly useful, for example, if there really is, is no capsule or bag present, if, um, if the lens is not amenable for sutured loops, uh, and or if we wish to use uh, alternative to Gore-Tex and not have to open the conjunctiva. So here's a 30 gauge, that same TSK needle that we saw for the Imani, uh, feeding in that, uh, in this case, 6 Gore-Tex, 6 uh, proline through the, uh, the lumen of that needle. The challenge, of course, is getting that needle through that uh, optic without uh, that optic twisting too much and pulling out, of course, there's traction. So holding that um, capsular bag, if we can, without tearing it is important at the rex's edge. There's the second pass made above that. And so you can imagine now we've got two loops of that suture that's basically now through the optic material. Of course, it's very important to ensure that we're exactly 180 degrees apart. And so we've taken time to ensure that we've kind of visualized where that should be here. In this case, that's at the optic aptic junction, ideally the same distance apart as well. And, uh, and again, just piercing that needle through that optic. There's one pass, second pass again. And then comes the tension time, which again is probably even more challenging because we cannot adjust it once we actually, uh, well, it's difficult to adjust it once we actually bury those, those, uh, those knots. Um, so here's a bit, bit, bit of you know, pulling on either side to get that lens well centered. Again, take the time to do this really well. And, uh, and then we'll deal with the nasal side first. You can see we actually have edited this. We continue to kind of trim it down to what we're happy with. It helps to pull the lens to ensure we have tension. So we know we have tension. We have no laxity on that suture. And pull it to kind of almost over uh, ten tense it so the lens comes towards you. So then we push the, the suture back. It gets back into position. So that kind of uh, you know, over tensioning or snapback approach helps us to kind of visualize. It is subjective, though. And that's why it does take a bit of art for this. You see, we're pulling the lens over toward us, imagining how much do we need to pull, pull out, and understanding that, of course, melting the, the end will shorten that knot as well. It was cut, but then we said, you know, let's, let's do a bit more. Um, you can see that the lens is a bit shifted over temporally here, and that's okay because we know it's going to snap back into that position centrally. We're happy with it. We'll melt it, and then, and then of course, it's important to bury that suture adequately well under the conjunctiva. So a bell loop technique, very nice approach for that as well. <laughs> You know, we've already heard, we've already seen the approach for Yamani. I, I don't want to necessarily repeat that, but you know, tools are important. We have we have all, you know generally been using the Sensor AR40. We've been happy with that. The haptic diameter is a little bit larger, and so sometimes fitting it into that needle is a bit challenging. The alternative, of course, is the Technus lens, as as Cole has shown as well. 
So um, just, just one, little, one little tip that I will say is probably the hardest part in, um, lens of, this is the Iowa Exchange, the hardest part, and by the way, one thing, one thing is the fellows on this, I, I'm very particular about marking. I, I, I really think we need to you know, be very refined with our marks, make sure we really take the time to position them well, make them nice and clean. As Alan always said, the video has to look nice. We don't want messy marks everywhere and, and, uh, and difficult to see. Um, the challenge is that how do we ensure that sclerotal tunnel is two millimeters? Right, because we're marking it on the conjunctiva, we can't see that needle really well through the sclera. I, I, I tell the fellows the best way to do it is open the conjunctiva. Then you can visualize exactly where the needle is going and then you can perhaps have a better way. One way that we do is we just use a little sleeve from the iris hooks, if you notice that. See that little sleeve at the end of that needle? We take it off the iris hook, put it on the needle, mark two millimeters, and now that, that sleeve, which will basically retract as we hit the conge, gives us a guide. So now the needle is being placed about 20 degree angulation, go fairly flat toward that second um, dot. And now you see that the, flat, the, the sleeve of the iris hook is now at the conjunctival interface. Now we can go in. I've been, we're trying to get manufacturers to actually mark, the, mark these needles with two millimeter mark so we can actually know where we are. It's hard, harder said than done, apparently. But that's one little tip. Uh, we have both passes made. I typically keep the needle in. Again, we've done a full vitrectomy here. We've got an infusion in there as well. Well-controlled environment. And before actually bearing the, um, bearing the actual uh, flanges, it's helpful to keep the haptics externalized the same distance, and then look for centration of the lens. Because once you bury it, it is harder to adjust. We had to you know, pull it out, remove it, it's harder to do. So once we have those haptics externalized equidistant and the lens is centered, we say, okay, now if we bury it, we know we're gonna be okay. If not, we may need to cut one haptic a little bit to recenter it. So one little tip for Yamani on that one as well. There are alternatives not available in, in North America, like the Car Car Carla Valley lens, which is a hydrophilic, not hydrophobic lens, designed with special posts that can be all one in, in one piece lens that can be used with, with a similar approach uh, without having to pass any sutures. You know, there are sorts of situations like this where we have a patient with high degree of astigmatism that's aphakia. Um, there are a variety of different lenses that can be used. The MX60T lens happens to have a, an open haptic optic junction, which is not designed for this, uh, but can be used for looping uh, suture. And so this is an approach that, you can, that we can use by scleral fixation. Here, passing needle, passing the sutures through, and then passing the sutures through the actual eyelet of the MX60. Uh, I, you know, one can also use the belt loop technique as well. I'm just using Gore-Tex. Uh, and now we have that uh, suture pass aligned with the steep axis of that corneal astigmatism and can be placed in. I typically, um, there's a second pass for each throw and typically cut the haptics off. We don't need them. We don't want them to cause any uv irritation. Uh, again, the, probably the biggest challenge here is suture tension. If they're too tight, the lens will tilt and or cheese wire through the optic material, which has been reported. If they're too loose, of course, they'll be decentered. So taking the time for adequate centration. But, but these are very nice, clever techniques to, to manage aphakia uh, you know, in, the, in the presence of high astigmatism. So it's really incredible what our field has, uh, has you know, innovated in this space in managing these complex eyes with, uh, with, uh, with the lack of capsule support. And there's an example of a fixated lens. Let me just switch to iris suture lenses. Um, you know, the uh, iris fixation has certainly been reported for many, many decades. Uh, this is a fixed distance, unlike a sulcus lens, which can be mobile relative to the iris or vice versa. The lens is actually fairly fixed from the iris, peripheral iris. Um, and that's a little bit of a different. Often people say, well, aren't you going to get UX syndrome? Well, actually, it's less likely theoretically at least because the optic is fixed distance from the iris rather than the iris moving independent of the lens, at least theoretically. In our iridotomy is still suggested to reduce the risk of reverse pupil block. And there's an example of the IOL position here on UBM. The benefits here is that there's no external sutures. There's no needle or scleral passes. Less vitrectomy is required. We're not working at a vitreous base or ciliary body in that sense. We can get excellent centration. Tilt is less because of that reason. We're suturing to the iris. But we need to use the right lens. Ideally, a posterior vaulted lens, three-piece lens that's not in the bag. One pieces don't work well. We need the iris to be stable. A lot of denesis can be a problem. Peak pupil can be a problem. And in uveitis, we probably want to be an extra, extra cautious here. It is helpful to have your preferred suture technique uh, of tying with a variety are out there that we can use. And uh, this is just an example of an IOL exchange. Uh, this IOL is removed, cut and removed, and then the, uh, this is a, an AR40 lens again. It's our preferred lens here. 
Uh, I like to put the lens in the anterior chamber. Now, the danger here is after some vitrectomy has been done here, just minimal amount. I feel in these examples, we don't need an effective vitrectomy. We're just looking at removing vitreous from the anterior chamber and retropilatory space. The danger is how do you suture that lens to the iris without it dropping, on, dropping onto the retina? Uh, we use a pupil capture technique where we capture the optic of the lens in the pupil. This is all kind of done with your third hand in some ways. The haptics go underneath, and the optic stays in front, and then myocal is put in to bring the pupil down and capture it. Um, this technique is, is helpful uh, to control the positioning here with a, with a pair of micro graspers and a Kuglin hook. And now we bring the lens forward uh, with that hook so we're anterior to the iris. Uh, myocal is put in. I don't think we let go yet. Well, it did let go. We very carefully wanted to manipulate things as well. And uh, again, be careful not to overpressurize the eye. Too much OVD in the eye could end up uh, causing the pupil to dilate and the lens to drop. Suture position should be placed uh, in the mid peripheral iris, not near the pupil. Take as small as bite as you can. This is a CIF4 needle on a tenoproline. Tenoproline works well for the iris over years. Uh, although we would like to have a better suture material, uh, anything thicker I think is not as, as compatible. Uh, you see the lens is lifted up. It's, it's important to pass the needle passes equidistant uh, along the meridian of the first pass and, uh, and be very minimal in the amount of iris that's graphs. Sorry, shameless advertising. Um, I don't make any money on that, but uh, many years ago we didn't have these instruments and I was appreciative of, of industry to work with us to get these in. These are specially designed micro tires. And, uh, and these are suturing in the eye, which we were, we were first to do many, many years ago with Al Alan, Alan's uh, support. Um, and uh, we're suturing in the eye. Whatever your preferred suture technique, use it. Mechanical, seepser, intraocular tying. But do it in a way that we minimize any traction on the iris. You know, as again, you can imagine Alan's here talking, right, in terms of the eye should be minimally moving, the ergonomics, the tissue manipulation is minimal. I mean, this, this really is, is Alan, Alan's, uh, is Alan's video in all, in all essences. This is another approach. We could, my, my fellows have called this the McAmid approach. It's kind of mechanical plus a bit of our technique where we slide the knot into the eye. And, uh, and so whatever approach we use, we do it with hopefully a minimal manipulation. So the lens stays really, really fixed. Here's an important pearl. Don't lock the knot yet. Prolapse the optic behind the iris and you'll see that often the pupil will be ovalized. Now, why is it ovalized? Maybe the knots are placed asymmetrical, but most likely we have some iris that has been imbricated in the knots. So release it before you lock the knot. Pull the, pull the iris centripetally to release it from the knot, pulling on the suture, and now this pupil becomes round. Pupil ovalization is, is not ideal. It's the reason why I, I've seen some surgeons uh, abandon iris suturing, amongst other reasons. Uh, like any other approach, this is technically something that is a learning curve for, but you can see the pupil now is beautifully around. Now we can cinch the knot and then lock the knot in place, again, using whatever approaches we use. And uh, it's all done, again, minimal vitrectomy, nearly physiologic, not quite, uh, and without any external manipulation or anything else. I had to put this paper in again, one of, one of Alan's paper that, that I did with him back again after my fellowship. And you know, large series of, large series of, uh, of, of, of uh, IOLs fixated to, to eyes. AC IOLs, well, I know it's not necessarily our favorite, but uh, it's certainly, I think, appropriate for certain patients who have normal corneas. Maybe we want to avoid doing much in just vitrectomy, if any, maybe some of our older patients, lot to be ageist. Uh, but of course, sizing is critical. And certainly we have had a lot of experience using the artisan lens as an alternative for enclavation where sizing isn't as important. It can be placed on the anterior iris or posterior iris. Um, I want to just leave with one point, one more mention here, because I know we have some refractive surgeons here. A question we often get is, what is the impact of alternate eyelid fixation on post-op refraction? Um, we know, of course, that ELP is dependent on the position of the lens from the corneal vertex. And when we image these patients, we see in the bag, sulcus IOLs, of course, are more anterior. We have to adjust for the power. And then we have a variety of different optic capture techniques. Optic capture regularly, re reverse optic capture, buttonhole. Each of them have a certain position, and, and we'll show the results shortly. I would the lenses, you can see it's a bit more anteriorly, typically, especially if the capsule is present. So our sutures sit, can sit reasonably, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, plain with typical in the bag lenses, and again, same with Yamani. And uh, in our study of about 200 eyes, you can see, as I said, sulcus iris fixated sit more anteriorly. Uh, the approaches we use, actually, we position our sterile lenses a bit more posteriorly than, than typical because of our landmarks. We're extra careful to keep away from the iris. 
And this can impact, of course, our, our refractive error. Just something to consider in terms of how we how we target. I typically will um, will aim for uh, slightly more high, high, slightly more myopia when I slow fixate. When I, when I iris fixate, I typically I'm at plano or maybe slightly more on the hyperopic aim. But that's typically our, our, our results. So at the end of the day, what is our best approach? Well. There really is no best approach. The evidence doesn't show any superiority for any single approach um, that, uh, that's been out there. And that's, of course, something that's very difficult to study. And again, it probably is some, something uh, we need to consider as far as our approach. This is kind of a large table when I kind of divide up angle-supported IOLs, artisan lenses, iris sutures, scleral sutured, and haptic fixation. These are the different variables to consider. How close are we to the cornea? Are there any angle issues? Do we need iris? What about suture breakage? What about infection track? Uh, erosions? What about tilting, denesis, ovalization, vitrectomy needs, and technical ease? And I guess this is where, again, the art of, of, uh, of our own you know, personal approaches. I always say go with your fastball pitch, but, but remember the batter, and you may want to adjust accordingly in terms of, uh, in terms of what approach would be best for that patient. So I hope I've been able to share with you um, uh, some, some thoughts um, and uh, approaches with this. Again, uh, uh, there's no claim from me that one approach is better than the other, uh, but hopefully I've shared some considerations as we approach these patients in terms of what's the best approaches and technique pros and managing uh, for optimal allo fixation in the absence of capsule support. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Bill. Thank you. I next. Have we heard of any cases of Gore-Tex suture failure? And does it look so far that's going to stand the test of time? Not, not that it's been reported to us. We have not seen it during. But we've still seen, you know, when you look at proline, we've still seen tanoproline fail in the iris. And I know that nitroproline is not going to be suturing back to the iris, but we have seen cases of tanoproline eventually break down and fail in the iris. But uh, Gore-Tex, we've not seen it either in the, well, in the sclera, we've not seen any Gore-Tex. Yeah, I, I agree. Over, I, I don't heard. I haven't heard of any any patient yet with Gore-Tex. Although the problem with Gore-Tex, if it's left under the cons, you can get some pretty nasty erosions. We have seen that happen. And uh, yeah, Nick is right. I mean, I, proline does degrade with UV. Also, it can break with mechanical forces. So there's cer certainly that risk on the iris. We we see it very uncommonly in, in our experience, but it's certainly a consideration. We do need better suture material. We're trying to work with Gore. I think Nick. I think you know that as well to develop a good 9 or 10 for cornea, for iris. That's kind of what we really hope to achieve uh, in the future. Very good. Well, thank you.
Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. Um, lovely to see you all. I am excited. Uh, I bring tokens uh, of excitement here. Uh, and thank you, Ethan, for getting um, the, the talk pulled up as well. So, uh, you know, for, for those of you uh, residents, for many, many years, there's this legacy of medical students who have gone to ophthalmology working with Nick and Liliana, working with Randy. In fact, the, these Olson labs, so to speak, which has always been something really highly focused on cataract surgery, machines, efficiency, et cetera. Uh, that's really been a, a bread and butter for many years for medical students going to ophthalmology here. And it's, it's quite a legacy. It's been something that uh, I've been uh, tremendously grateful along with some other faculty to be engaged and involved in. Uh, so I want to dive right in with a few things. Uh, I do have relevant financial disclosures. I will be discussing a product by Zeiss, also uh, studies uh, that uh, are, are done with Allergan's uh, equipment as well. So we've known for a long time that endothelial uh, health is affected by cataract surgery. This is a uh, pre-me being born 1976 uh, reference uh, by Byrne and Kaufman. Uh, we know this, um, and yet there's still been a lot of controversy over time, uh, really up until just a couple of years ago. And I want to give uh, Nick and Liliana, and again, Dr. Olson, uh, some credit. This is my favorite series uh, ever on endothelial health. And, and effectively, there's all these comments or sort of you'd hear from podiums uh, f fluidics I actually have heard this that it's really it's not the cataract surgery it's not the ultrasound energy or cavitation it's actually just the fluid that hits the endothelium with FACO and that's the reason why you get endothelial breakdown there were still controversies and questions over whether or not uh, dispersive viscoelastics were actually protective or not and this this is just a beautiful series of studies that they did these are all uh, done in rabbits uh, so you get nice physique physiologic response. Um, and this first study is the viscoelastic study. And effectively, uh, as expected, but yet finally actually shown in, in a uh, proper research uh, method, you have dispersive viscoelastic uh, preserving endothelial cells better than cohesive. And so that was actually a really big win. And the nice thing is all of these studies were done with similar parameters. So now you're doing the same type of studies, but now you're looking at intralenticular debris. And I really like this. They, they they introduce these beads to simulate FACO fragments that could be hitting the endothelium. And so the control group was no beads. The test group was beads. Uh, and indeed, when you did introduce beads that were circulating into the, in, in the anterior chamber, hitting the endothelium, as expected, but finally shown, uh, there was a you know, significant loss of endothelial cells. But that wasn't all. Uh, they, they finally um, had a great study on fluid flow. And the fluid flow, again, didn't actually end up being that determinative, which was really nice and helpful for us to understand the, the, uh, the pathology of what's happening. Uh, longitudinal or torsional, this is a really, really age old as far as FACO goes, goes discussion, which is more friendly or which is less friendly to the endothelium. Now the way the study was done is it was set at 60% using a balanced tip. And that's important because 60% for longitudinal and 60% for torsional, they, they are not the same. That is known. It's known that it's not the same. In fact, on the Alcon machine, you actually have uh, different hertz. The ultrasound torsional is lower at 32 hertz, whereas the uh, longitudinal actually oscillates at 44 hertz. And not only that, there's a known difference uh, in cavitation. Uh, cavitation, again, these, these micro explosions that occur, uh, that still is up for debate. How much, how much of the energy, how much of the uh, lens breakup is due to cavitation versus actual mechanical, uh, more of a jackhammer effect. Uh, so uh, what they found here, not surprisingly necessarily, but at 60% power for longitudinal versus 60% power at torsional, uh, you had more endothelial cell loss with longitudinal and more cavitation on their videos. So uh, I do just want to, again, acknowledge and thank them for that series. But it got us asking the question, if we know that there's a different amount of energy being delivered uh, with longitudinal versus torsional, and yet CDE readings don't always follow along with that, what, how could we capture the amount of energy delivered to the eye? Uh, and so with uh, our, our Olson group, I'll just go right to the hypothesis. We propose that the amount of energy delivered to the anterior segment of the eye is different across platforms. Uh, at different power levels. And not only that, it would be different uh, at longitudinal settings versus torsional. Uh, and so we 
we tested this hypothesis using thermodynamics via calorimetry uh, as one of our medical student presentations given ASCRS. Uh, calorimetry, what is that? I mean, effectively, this is, we, we know that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be um, converted from one form to the other. So we uh, designed an experiment where we created a calorimetry chamber. Uh, we would place the phacal emulsification tips at the same, uh, the same settings on each of these three platforms, and then we would simply measure the temperature rise. And so we could truly capture the amount of energy delivery to a system as a surrogate to energy delivery to an eye. Uh Unsurprisingly, um, there was a difference between platforms, and actually quite a significant difference between platforms. They were all done with longitudinal FACO, so on some level, the, the true apples to apples comparison. A little bit of interesting variability in the 80% uh, to the 100% torsional energy delivery uh, with the Alcon, which we're gonna look at. But what we've shown through this and then another series is the amount of energy delivered to the eye certainly doesn't always correlate to the CDE number. But yet we also know that the amount of energy delivery to the eye isn't the only variable that's important. Uh, and what, what does that mean and why are we talking about this? So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, this is the Zeiss Micor uh, handpiece. This entire uh, apparatus, which uh, you see here, you've got a handpiece, which is the motor. This plugs in to a, an outlet effectively. And then you have the Micor handpiece. And so this, uh, this is inserted into the handpiece. It twists, and this is how you do your phaco emulsification, or I'm going to call it your cataract extraction. There is no phaco. There is no ultrasound in this. Uh, this is a different mechanism. There is no foot pedal. Your foot pedal is here, position one, is actually turned on right now by opening up a little clip. And you open up that clamp, you're in position one. Position two equivalent, aspirating fluid is done through the first 50% of the excursion. And then the equivalent position three where you're actively engaging with some, I'll call it pulsatile energy Energy is in that final 50%. So this is all that you're holding. There is no machine. It simply plugs into the wall and you proceed with your cataract removal as you typically would. Now this is a, a straight tip. So if you're used to some sort of bend in your tip, that's a, that's you're going to need a different approach. Um, and so if you learn cataract surgery in the day when all tips were straight, then you're gonna be probably a little bit more comfortable with this. And so this is actually ready for commercialization. There's a, a handful of physicians around the country that they're having uh, demo, provide feedback uh, on, on this. So let's learn a little more about what this is, what the experience is, and then why I need Nick and Liliana's help. So uh, MyCore 700, uh, this is a, a couple slides are provided by Zeiss uh, for full disclosure. Uh, it's a, a novel cataract lens fragmentation device. Disassembles via mechanical agitation rather than ultrasound power. Uh, and it aspirates fragments with, I'm gonna take a little bit of issue with the term peristaltic pump. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, this, this, isn't, this isn't truly a peristaltic pump. I'm gonna call this a, 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 mechanical, uh, a mechanical pump. So you have a motor that spins, uh, and that motor spins, and it spins a series of cams. And and those cams, as they move forward and back, create the aspiration and suction. Again, in that equivalent of position three, you also have engagement of what's called the cutter, which moves forward a piston within the needle forward and back to provide some actual mechanical agitation. But effectively, this feels like this feels like a FACO handpiece with a whole lot of vacuum and a whole lot of aspiration. And it does, importantly, have a rounded tip at the end, but uh, it does feel a lot like doing cataract surgery with, with a fake emulsification tip. One thing that is slightly different uh, with this device is the sound. Uh, if you are able to hear this online, so again, as that motor is spinning and you've got those cams clicking, it clicks. As I remember, this is sitting right around 44 hertz, whereas ultrasound is sitting around 44,000. Correct. 40, 44 Thank kilohertz. You. Yep, so you're exactly right. You're talking a thousand, thousand times different. 
So um, the, the, the sound is noticeable. You walk by the room, you're in the room, you're hearing the sound. And I, I actually had a patient just anecdotally last week. Once that sound started, she actually asked for more uh, sedation. Uh, it, it kind of was a little bit unsettling to her, which, which was uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon. So um, you've got that clicking happening. This is, uh, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to kind of more the bread and butter of what this case is going to look like. This is going to be a pre-chop technique. So these are already fragmented. We're not using a lot of energy. Uh, this is uh, effectively unedited here. Uh, and, and it's going to look and feel and sound, or at least it's going to look a whole lot like a typical phaco emulsification uh, case. We're going to bring the quadrant up. Uh, this is, you know, kind of a one and a half to two density lens. And you can see it pretty comfortably aspirates in. This is just split up, sped up 2x. Uh, I, I do operate more slowly with this, um, still within the first 50 cases. And, and what I really try to do with this is I always try to put the uh, I always try to put the, the fragments right at the end of the tip. Again, this really pulls things in directly in front, uh, and I'm trying to limit the amount of energy I'm putting in the eye, the amount of that clicking that you're hearing. And again, it, it's not going to look a whole lot different from a tif typical uh, FACO case. Is it a single vacuum? You, you don't adjust the vacuum in this, I'm assuming. You don't. Uh, you don't. The, the only thing that you can vary is that finger hand position. And so it does increase in, in its, I'm going to call it its rate of aspiration rather than vacuum the way that we think about it with a peristaltic pump. Do we know what that vacuum is full on? How much have they, have they measured that? We are finding that out. I'm saying that because uh, that, that's something that I'm, I don't think they really know of what it's actually in a closed system. Right. But, you know, we've got technology we can do that. That is, that is, that is one of the in-process in studies right now. And if there are residents interested, we, we always welcome help with these studies. Uh, so I'm showing this. Uh, you saw we did cortical cleaving hydrodissection. There was not any cortex at the end. Uh, that isn't unique to this um, device that just happened to be the hydrodissection. This is the IA tip. And the, the interesting thing about the IA, um, there's not a whole lot interesting to, to watch there other than it functions like an IA tip. The way that you switch from uh, actual, the equivalent cataract extractor to uh, the IA tip is you remove the extraction tip, you take your IA tip, and then that simply slides in, and then that just rotates into place. If you need to polish the capsule, there's actually a different amount of excursion. You turn it to a, a P setting polish that lowers that vacuum level. To get back to your full vacuum, you just rotate that a little bit. Uh, you can do that in the eye. I've done that in the eye. It is a curved IA tip. It's actually got a nice textured polish to the end. So uh, there, there's a number of really interesting things about uh, this device. Uh, one is the amount of energy delivered to the eye. So we did this, uh, this same calorimetry uh, test with the MyCore, and it was barely measurable. Uh, and and they, they do know that this does not generate heat in the same way that uh, phaco emulsification does. However, uh, I do want to thank Tony uh, Mai, who was with, with me on our first cases as we've gone through this, who you know, took it upon himself to go ahead and uh, do a little hypothesis testing here. So he, we were doing same day post-ops, post-op day zero. He sees my typical cataract surgery cases the same day, sees the amount of endothelial, uh, or rather the amount of swelling, uh, corneal swelling. And he just reviewed first four patients that, that he was with me for, uh, looked at cataract type, a desired outcome, nuclear density, complications, if any. And what he really noticed, um, um, just, uh, I'll, I'll actually just show this briefly. The, this is going to be more of a horizontal chop technique, at least uh, initially. So it does lend itself well to a horizontal chop or even, even a vertical chop uh, with a little bit of modification can be done. But effectively what he noticed, you'll see this post-op day zero, this kind of three plus corneal edema, corneal edema, corneal edema. So, Bill, um, your typical post-op day zero, what's your corneal edema rating on most cases? Um, for a typical lens, there's not any corneal. Yeah, yeah. There's not. 
Yeah, there's really not that much. Now, now that can vary, of course, but typical lens are just not a lot. And it was really interesting, uh, again, uh, and a few things that go into this, keep in mind, these are first cases. So, so there certainly is a contributor to, to the operator and the inexperience. Um, but uh, Tony, any comments from the back? It was really interesting because you had some other normal big movies that same day. There was a stark difference in the edema scene. And I think we're just curious of why this is that there is not much energy in the sky, at least the way that we think. Yeah, and, and even Tony's cases had less edema than these cases. So it was. <laughs> Tony is an excellent surgeon. I can only say things like that when they're excellent surgeons. Jeff, we can study that. Go ahead, Nick. We can study that. Yeah, and, and the, the question then, it's interesting, we have proposed a couple of studies uh, to them. Uh, th there's, uh, there's not a lot of. There's not a lot of funding for a, a larger rabbit study, and that's re that really becomes the issue. Uh, and yet, uh, this this is due to go to commercialization right around the time of ASCRS. This this phenomenon hasn't been reported uh, as we've gone on with with faster times. Uh, interestingly, again, there's no machine where you're seeing a readout at the end. They do have an app uh, that you can read out what is your cumulative amount of time in that position two equivalent, your position three equivalent, but really the thing that they're measuring, and this is what uh, this is what Zeiss is really kind of touting, is this decreased fluid use. This uses less fluid than FACO. This is the bag, and and for an entire case, it will be between 15 to 30 total ml that goes through the eye. So there's not a lot of fluid going through the eye, and. Uh, we already know, however, that doesn't necessarily affect endothelial health. Um, we know that this doesn't develop, you know, generate a lot of heat, and yet there is something about it, something about that, presumably, that percussive sound, and you feel it in the handpiece, that percussion. So even though the overall amount of energy is low, uh, certainly that percussion transmitting through the endothelium, and, and the, the edema tends to really be temporal uh, near the wound. Uh, and the one other just, just variation with FACO that's relevant here is during IA, you get the same amount of energy delivery effectively. Uh, there's no difference because that cam and that motor still has to turn. That clicking is the same. It doesn't engage an actual plunger forward and back. But uh, again, I can't feel a difference in my hand in that position three equivalent. Uh, but once you go into position two where you're engaging that motor, you're definitely feeling it. So uh, that is the challenge that we have and, and something that's really important because, again, as this goes to commercialization and this is not known, uh, this is something that's going to be really important for surgeons to consider. Certainly uh, better for softer lenses, uh, but it's a really unique piece of technology that works very well that might be a great solution in healthy corneas with you know less dense lenses. Randy. So they're touting this thing as the best thing since sliced bread. And they're touting all kinds of claims and advantages and the rest of this stuff without, you know, documentation. And so uh, I, I have a feeling that what's happening here, and I have Nick's got the smile, he knows exactly what exactly. I think that that low 44 hertz is very efficiently bouncing stuff off at, you know, at a, at a, at a much more efficient level. And, and that, that would make sense because but the overall travel and the chance for something going at 44,000 hertz, there, there's just not enough to catch anything. This is catching stuff. And that information needs to get out. So I think it's worth our just putting some money in and, and, and getting ahead of this curve. Because if, indeed, if you're seeing that kind of corneal edema, you're not getting that kind of corneal edema without real corneal endothelial damage. And, and, and I'm not aware of anybody who's done uh, you know, spectral microscopy trying to look and see what's happening. And yet this is clear evidence to me that, that this could be a, a, 
a problem and there's a significant loss of corneal endothelial cells and damage. So I'd say let's get a rabbit study up and go and let's just use resources that we can bring in internally because I think this is a real, real positive, important information we need to get out to people understanding. Don't use this in Fuchs dystrophy. You shouldn't be using it on a heart or cataract. Um, and and maybe, maybe even in general, this is not something that we should be using because of corneal endothelial concerns. What viscoelastic do you typically use in these types of cases? Yeah, so starting, uh, my, my typical viscoelastic is discovisc for all cases. I did eventually convert uh, to duovisc uh, using the, you know, dispersive to protect the endothelium. It improved. It was a noticeable improvement between the cases. Brian Selinski operates with me. Brian, think, think what, you, what have you noticed? Yeah, I mean, the big thing that I definitely noticed is the change for your cases when you started using this was a lot of central decimate folds, which seemed very odd to us because, I mean, most of the edema was closer to the, to the wound. Um, since using that dispersive, there's definitely been a noted less central decimate folds. The corneal edema is still present, but the central decimate folds are a lot less, for sure. Yeah, it's been interesting, you know, so, so you know, my, my communication with Zeiss, again, I am a consultant, and, and I, I've, really, I've really pushed them on this, uh, and, you know, I, I said, yeah, there's still more edema, and they said, oh, we thought the problem was solved with, you know, using a dispersive, and, well, that doesn't really solve the problem if it's still um, ca causing edema, and, you know, if you have to use a dispersive just to keep corneas clear. Uh, so so this, uh, this, again, uh, there, there's a number of things um, that... Well, there's not a lot out there published at all, number one. Uh, the things that you can find, Randy, are the, like this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, and it's something that uh, I, I certainly can't imagine that this is just exclusively due to, um, you know, only in my hands at this point. Um, we, we, no. In fact, they tell me I use... I use less fluid, less overall time. I'm as efficient as anyone they've ever used. I mean, and... Yeah, they're claiming because of less fluid, it's gonna be more corneal friendly. In spite of the study we did, and the differences are in the range of, you know, 20, 30 milliliters of the total case, I'm thinking, no, nah, you, you've, you've got to truly show that, that this is better to point this out. And if you're seeing more edema, I, I'm confident that that 44 hertz is just much more efficient way of bouncing lens particles off the cornea. And so there's going to be more corneal damage. Nick? Yeah, this really lends itself. It's actually screaming for a study looking at, at what's going on with this. And the nice thing about the rabbit model, the rabbit model is not good for long term endothelial damage because the rabbit endothelium regenerates. It's not like human endothelium. But for acute studies with the model that we've used, it's very good at picking up. So we could compare this to a standard ultrasound. We could do the, the vital staining and we'd be able to tell a difference right away. And so I hope we can come up with a way to make this work because that's really critical because everything that was said right up to the point that you said about the corneal edema said, wow, this is like cut, you know, toasted bread now. This is the greatest thing since toast. But now when you're seeing this, that's going to be an issue. And then we can always we can even do a corollary study looking at dispersive OVD as opposed to cohesive OVD, see if there's a difference there too. And so there's a couple of different studies if we want you know, residents or students to be involved with if they can go ahead and, and get done in the lab. It's just a matter of coming up with funding and if I'm you know Zeiss is not gonna fund this for you. No. <laughs> if this comes no. out you may be checking for wires under your car because <laughs> You may not want to have this, this come out, but I think this is something that would really be beneficial to actually look at in a, in a controlled study. Yeah. You, you will see by the patterns. The patterns will tell you very clearly whether you're getting these, these shell impact marks. I mean, I mean, where you're getting that scattered debris, you'll, you'll get an area just nuked, and an area that's just nuked, and another one that's just nuked, and you can just see, well, that's, you can see the particle size by bam. Corneal endothelium, where that thing whacked into the cornea, is just gone. And and I'll, I'll we'll end the recording here, Ethan. Uh, here's the off the record part that's been really interesting. It's been really interesting because um, of, of course it's exciting to be a you know part and be able to use this, and yet I've really felt this obligation that that this. 
this is information that really should get out there. And, and I had one of our med students on a phone call with me with this team. And I said, we've got a number of really good studies we could do, not, not even rabbit level funding, but just some, some studies. And, and the response back was, well, you know, I'm, we're really interested in funding studies that show that we win. And, uh, and you know, I've got the med students sitting there on the phone call, you know, and I'm like, this is going to be a real teaching moment. So, you know, we ended the call. Um, we haven't done any win studies, uh, for the record. Uh, but I called the student media and I said, that, that's such, such a great lesson for you. And, and, you know, that's the interesting dynamic and tension between, you know, having, having healthcare drive so much uh, of our economy, uh, it certainly drives innovation, but the, al the alignment of industries and interests, which is also patient care and patient well-being, it's also not our same alignment. And that was a really, really interesting. If, if we're off uh, being recorded now, maybe Alcon will fund this. <laughs> <laughs> then, then people would scream foul. And that, that, that was also my I think this is one where we just come up with some money where we can do it. I think, I think working with that, you know, let, let's let's figure out a way to do this. Is there's going to be real expenses, but let's let's figure out how to get this and put it out. I think we need to do this sooner rather than later because people need to know this, and and it's I, I'm confident that this is going to be much harder on the endothelium. How, how much harder we don't know, but it's going to be much harder, and people need to know that. Yeah, yeah, Eric. I was just curious, like the last bullet point is really exciting, but then I want to get your thoughts on how you uh, think about that same piece in relation to our healthcare system and our role as ophthalmologists in this country, like what's happening with scope and anesthesia, absent cataract surgery, et cetera. Yeah, that's a really great question. This this really does lend itself to kind of an office space, minimal, uh, you know, wh where I would see like a business case for this. If I was um, going to do office space surgery, I don't want to invest in the capital of a full FACO machine. If I break bag and have vitreous, I'm going to close up and send it next door. I'm not going to even dabble in the dark arts of trying to fix a complication. If it happens, it's gone out the door. And I actually think that from just a volume of care perspective, you know, delivering care that th this has a, in, in you know, assume it works for those type of cases I think it's got a place um, and you know how that then affects the overall system of care you know scope battles etc uh, I, I, I think it I, my I would anticipate that it would just continue to accelerate uh, that that challenge of, of the blurred lines between what is a surgeon and and what is not a surgeon the, the idea of this is so lovely for working in internationally, of course, right? It's like, yes. And, you know, I, I, I've had a couple three plus nuclei with this. It's, it's just not, uh, it's not efficient. It's not ever going to be uh, the path in its current iteration. Could there be something similar in the future uh, that is developed that's, you know, portable, um, able to be used in, you know, four plus, three, four plus lenses possible. But um, as, as is, this isn't it. And and, that, and yet, I'm, I, the technology is amazing. It's re I mean, it's really, really impressive. Right? That, that's doing the case right there. The machine's not in the room, so. Could you imagine developing world with rock hard cataracts and producing a whole bunch of aphakic or pseudophakic bullous keratopathy? I mean, that's a disaster. Yeah. Yes. In the developing world. Just a disaster because those people are unlikely to ever get. And, and it's not just that they can't see, that's pain. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's worse blindness if there is. You got to know this. Dr. Selleck has a comment. Oh. Yes. Brian, go ahead. Disposable or reusable? Uh, the portions that are reusable, uh, this motor itself is reusable, re-sterilizable. So it, uh, it's interesting, you know, you do think, uh, I, no one's done the carbon footprinting uh, on what the, you know, the amount of carbon footprint going to this versus a typical FACO pack. Uh, I would imagine it'd be similar. Uh, there are some metal pieces here and you don't have that in a typical FACO pack, but that's another interesting uh, question. Do you know what they're going to cost, charge for the reusable stuff? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in short, more than a FACO pack. Uh, the idea is, well, you don't have the capital expenditure for FACO. The challenge is everyone already has the capital expenditure for FACO. So right now, even within our, our health system, the answer is 
and, and I'm on this committee, this costs so much more per case that there really isn't a good valid justification for continuing to to purchase this because it just adds cost per case uh, where you know, we have all the infrastructure in place. If you were in a scenario where you were using it in an OR for simple lenses, healthy patients, uh, you didn't need to purchase an additional FACO machine, you could, you could, you know, do a pro forma test case and I think you'd, you'd come out ahead. So, you know, you eliminate service agreements, things like that. Nick, Nick get with Luna, that's, that's fast track. Yeah. I'll find us the money. This is the kind of thing that we can do well to get that word out. <laughs> Eric? I think I don't just. I think that's smart on Zeiss's part from a business perspective because if they lower the cost per FACO, that's going to drive the reimbursement down. So to increase surgeon adoption, they want to keep it higher mm -hmm. to keep that pressure off the system. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's uh, the cheaper and more efficiently we do surgery, uh, the less we'll get paid for it, and that you know, we've certainly seen that effect o over time. I have no idea how much a FACO machine costs. How many would you? Packs of these would you have to buy to like equal out the cost of that initial FACO machine? Like, is it? Yeah, I think it's an eighty dollar delta right now per case, uh, and you'd have to really roll into all the service agreements. It, it's unfortunately not a simple answer. Um, FACO machines. Probably, probably you would amortize in a thousand cases. It's cheaper to have. So I mean, we. I mean, it, it wouldn't make any financial sense for us to even close to them. You'd have to replace a new FACO machine probably every eight, six, seven months, actually, in, in, to, to be equivalent in cost. And obviously, we can get years out of the FACO machine. Generate a lot of accordion business, though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We, 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 we'll produce a bunch of accordion. <laughs> no, no. We, we, we need to get the word out. I, okay, I have a feeling that accordion is a very big <laughs> problem. Okay. True cost corneal edema in a routine cases, Bill, just doesn't happen anymore. Just doesn't. Even with a resident, that's, that's a lot of the yeah. routine. Yeah, even with a resident. Yeah. I was operating, not Tony, but just to be clear. Um, all right, everyone, go have a beautiful day. Thank you. Yep, that's it. And the heteractic. And feel it's like a position one. That's a longer industrial like summit. If I was a reason to talk this year, I wouldn't I like having the lucky one to see this team. You know, it was, 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 it